November of 1792, a small group of these scales Carmelite nuns of Compiègne began reciting a prayer every day, offering themselves for the salvation of France. Their prayer was answered. It all began with a dream. In 1693, a 29-year-old disabled lay woman born in the Carmel of Compiègne dreamt of Jesus escorted by his mother, Saint Teresa of Avila, and two other Carmelites connected with the monastery. After receiving personal instructions about her own vocation, she then beheld a vision in which a number of Carmelites were being chosen to follow the Lamb. Fast forward to 1786, Mother Teresa of Saint Augustine, newly elected prioress of the same monastery, found an account of this vision that Sister Elizabeth Baptiste had prior to taking her vows as a Carmelite. Mother Teresa sensed the dream was a prophecy regarding her own community. The community of Carmelite nuns at Compiègne had been established in 1641, a daughter house of the monastery of Amiens. The community rapidly flourished and was renowned for its fervor and fidelity to the spirit of Saint Teresa of Jesus, the mother of the Discales Carmelite order. From its beginnings, it enjoyed the affection and esteem of the French court until the fatal turn of the French Revolution when they then became, along with all other religious groups, the object of hatred and scorn. The anti-religious views of the new regime were proved by their proclaiming the vows taken by religious as null and void. Despite growing hostility, the nuns of Compiègne continued to live their religious life and refused to abandon their religious habit. Rumors of riots taking place in Paris continued to reach the nuns, which warned them of the growing and dire situation at hand. Officials of the newly appointed local government visited the Carmelite Monastery of Compiègne with the intention of inspecting the monastery grounds and interviewing each of the nuns, while soldiers kept guard outside. The nuns were offered full freedom from the so-called vows with a suitable pension should they wish to leave the convent. They refused this offer with every single nun expressing their firm desire to remain faithful to their vows until death. On Easter of 1792, two days after the wearing of the religious habit became illegal on April the 6th, the dream was shared with other members of the community. Things then began to move quickly. By August, all women's monasteries were ordered closed and evacuated. The 20 Carmelites of Compiègne evacuated their monastery on September the 14th, the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross. Through the help of friends, they found shelter in four different locations and were able to acquire one set of civilian clothing. They could not afford to purchase a change of clothing and their request for funds from the government to do so went unanswered. A priest would visit the nuns dressed in civilian clothing and he would perform mass for the nuns. It was the holy sacrifice of the mass that gave them strength. Not too long after, Mother Teresa of St. Augustine shared with the four older squire sisters with whom she lived a proposal to invite the entire community to offer their lives for the salvation of France, in imitation of St. Teresa of Avila, who reformed Carmel for that express intention. She understandably met with immediate resistance. After all, who in their right mind would voluntarily submit themselves to instant decapitation by the newly inaugurated guillotine? Remarkably, however, within the space of a few hours, the two senior nuns begged the prioress forgiveness for the lack of courage. They opened the way for Mother Teresa to propose an act of self-offering to the other members of the community. As of November the 27th, each nun daily recited an act of self-offering for the salvation of France, written by the prioress. Eventually, an intention was added for the release of those who had been arrested and that fewer people would be guillotined. On June the 21st, 1794, soldiers searched the nuns' living quarters. The next day, they were arrested on evidence that turned up during the search that was used as proof that they continued to live a life of consecration and that their sympathies lay with the monarchy. The now 16-member Carmelite community found themselves imprisoned in a former visitation convent along with 17 English Benedictines. Religious congregations, especially contemplative ones such as the Carmelites, were particular targets of revolutionary forces because they were devoted to prayer rather than active in broader society and so were seen as not sufficiently productive. On July the 12th, 
as their only sets of civilian clothes were soaking, the mayor of Compiègne, accompanied by soldiers, burst into the convent, completely surprised to see them dressed in their habits. But their departure to Paris to undergo trial could not be delayed. On July the 17th, the 16 Carmelite nuns, along with 24 other prisoners, were found guilty of being enemies of the people, among other charges and sentenced to death. Each of the nuns now prepared themselves for the fulfillment of the prophetic dream. They would soon be following the Lamb. On the journey, as they were being paraded through the streets, the sisters chanted the combined offices of Vespers and Compline. This included the Miseria, the penitential Psalm 50, Have mercy on me, O God, in your kindness, and concluded with a Salve Regina. Eyewitness accounts report that the usually hostile crowds along the route were strangely silent. Before their execution, the nuns asked for a pail of hot water and washed their soiled clothing. They removed their civilian garb and put on their religious habits, which was to give witness to their religious profession. With a roll of the drums, the cart bearing the condemned nuns to execution emerged from the prison courtyard. As they awaited the guillotine, each sister knelt before the prioress and asked her permission to die. They kissed the scapula and the little statue of Our Lady, which she held out to each one as they renewed their vows for the last time on earth. Then they began chanting the Laudate Dominum, the Salve Regina, and the Magnificat, each of the sisters one by one. Beginning with the youngest, willingly placed themselves on the block of the scaffold, making an offering to God of their lives on behalf of the people and in union with the sacrifice of Jesus. The prioress was given the option of being the last to die. After she had encouraged each of her community and received their vows, she knelt down and renewed her religious profession in a clear voice and kissed the statue of Our Lady as others had done. With heroic courage, she mounted the scaffold chanting the Salve Regina until a voice was silent on earth. There was silence in the crowds that had gathered to witness the executions, with many in disbelief of the calmness and courage shown by the nuns. We know that Mother Teresa was the last to be executed. The 78-year-old Sister Mary of Jesus Crucified was heard saying to the executioners, I forgive you, my friends. I forgive you with all that longing of heart with which I would that God forgive me. The bodies of the Carmelites were buried in a mass grave. Within ten days of the execution of the Carmelites, many of those who had set in judgment of them and had them condemned to death were themselves brought before a tribunal and sentenced to death. By the end of August, the reign of the guillotine had come to an end. Without a doubt, it was the victorious offering and martyrdom of the Carmelite nuns of Compiègne which ended this reign of terror. As Mother Teresa of St. Augustine once said, Love will always be victorious. The one who loves can do everything. Mother Teresa of St. Augustine, Mother St. Louis, Mother Henriette of Jesus, Sister Mary of Jesus Crucified, Sister Charlotte of the Resurrection, Sister Euphrasia of the Immaculate Conception, Sister Teresa of the Sacred Heart of Mary, Sister Julie Louis of Jesus, Sister Teresa of St. Ignatius, Sister Mary Henrietta of Providence, Sister Constance, Sister Martha, Sister Mary of the Holy Spirit, Sister St. Francis Xavier, Catherine Soiron, Therese Soiron, pray for us.